Amen, amen. If you have your Bibles, open up to 1 Samuel chapter 7. Uh, 1 Samuel chapter 7, and we're going to be over in chapter 8 as well. In fact, you might rather uh, flip over to chapter 8 verses 1 through 9, because that's where I'm going to be reading here in just a moment. As you're getting open there and settled in here, let me encourage you, if you would, to uh, uh, grab some invitations on the way out for Reach Week, and you can invite folks to come to church. In particular, you can invite folks to go to church outside the walls next Sunday, and I hope everyone will make plans to be there. Uh, one thing I really do, we really want to encourage you to do is bring a lawn chair if you can. We'd like, we, we will have some extra seats, but we'd really like to be able to use those for any guests that come and for those who can't carry a chair. So uh, if you need help carrying a chair, let us know in the church office, and we, we'll try to find somebody to help you out uh, getting your stuff there. But Bring a chair if you can, and we look forward to worshiping together outside the walls next Sunday. First Samuel chapter 8, verses 1 through 9. Let me read these words to you in just a moment. If you would, please stand with me out of reverence for the reading of the words of our God. The author writes, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, in such a way that as on the words on this page being read, God himself is speaking to us. Verse 1. When Samuel became old, he made his sons judges over Israel. The name of his firstborn son was Joel, and the name of his second, Abijah. They were judges in Beersheba. Yet his sons did not walk in his ways, but turned aside after gain. They took bribes and perverted justice. Then all the elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah, and said to him, Behold, you are old, and your sons do not walk in your ways. Now appoint for us a king to judge us like all the nations. But the thing displeased Samuel when they said, Give us a king to judge us. Samuel prayed to the Lord. The Lord said to Samuel, Obey the voice of the people in all that they say to you, for they have not rejected you, but they have rejected me from being king over them. According to all the deeds that they have done from the day I brought them up out of Egypt, even to this day, forsaking me and serving other gods, so they are also doing to you. Now then, obey their voice. Only you shall solemnly warn them the ways of the king who shall reign over them. Let's pray together. O Lord our God, we thank you for Jesus. We thank you for his gospel. And, oh God, we ask if you would please move in our hearts today to be changed by your word. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Several years ago, uh, I was listening to a song by a punk band from Alabama called Lee Baines and the Glory Fires. And I want you to hear some lyrics this morning that struck me that I feel like are illustrative of some of what we'll be discussing this morning. Hear, hear what... Lee Baines has to say. He says, We were whooped with the good book, wound up shamed, sorry, and worse. But I yearned to burn the wrath out of every chapter and water the love in every verse. I've been struck by those lyrics in so many ways because, first of all, I don't think that the project that he's proposing is what's best for the Bible. Um, I don't think the love needs watering in the Bible. There's pure, unadulterated love in the Bible. And God's wrath is present in the Bible precisely because God is love. Um, and, and, and God loves holiness. <laughs> and God loves righteousness. And so God ha is just and won't tolerate um, those who are wicked. But one of the weirdest things about Christianity, though, and what... And what struck me more than any of this are those first two lines. It made me so sad. Because honestly, I, I don't blame him for what he wanted to do in the last two lines because of what he had learned about Christianity based on the first two lines. Let, let's do it again. We were whooped with the good book. Y'all know what a whooping is. We were whooped with the good book. And we wound up shamed, sorry, and worse. You see, I hate that that was his experience with Christianity because one of the weirdest things about Christianity, one of the things that sets us apart, theologians might prefer the word peculiar, one of the most peculiar and distinct things about 
Christianity is the fact that it is based entirely on grace. You see, there are plenty of legalism movements in the world. You can't throw a rock in the world without finding people who are trying to help people behave better. People who have a good book and who are trying to whoop people with it. But there's only one authentic grace movement. You see, what Christianity does and what the gospel does so beautifully is it takes all the glory off of us because it robs us of our ability to say that our ability to keep rules is what saves us. Now listen, if you want a religion that wants to tell you that your ability to keep rules is what saves you, they're a dime a dozen. But Christianity is unique in the sense that it highlights God's glory exclusively. It doesn't highlight our ability to keep rules. It highlights God's ability to keep us by His grace and for His glory. The human heart in its sinfulness hates grace. It hates grace not because we don't want a good thing from God. We do. We just want to earn it. We want God to justify us in our sin, not justify us despite our sin. Folks want to add to the gospel. And so that's where legalism comes from. That's that's where this desire to whoop people with the good book comes from. We have to have conformity and uniformity in all generations all the way through. Why do we desire this? It's because we want to show people how good we are at following rules and how good we are at creating a society that's good at following rules. But in recent years, people have started to see the way, in our society at least, this has been cycles of this throughout the history of Christianity, but People are starting to notice the way Christianity has been added to. Uh, Just remember, the gospel is not a pack mule. You don't pack anything on the back of it. People have started to notice the way that there are things packed onto the back. There are things riding on Christianity. People have seen the way people have pork barreled the gospel, added things in that aren't really of the Lord. And so a a sort of movement has, has come about, and people will call it deconstruction deconstruction. This is the idea of deconstructing your faith. That is, in essence, stripping it away from all the extra stuff. There's good and bad things to doing this. Historically, we've called this reformation uh, uh, in so many ways, but the deconstruction movement has actually started to sort of go beyond reformation and go beyond a lot of these things and really have begun to abandon things that are essential to the gospel, not just the cultural additions, not just the bathwater. We're starting to throw the baby out too. In other words, on both sides and all of the history of Christianity in every direction, you've, you've seen the gospel threatened. Now, I don't mean that anyone can genuinely threaten God or genuinely threaten the gospel, but what you see is all the time folks who are longing to make the gospel more palatable for those around it. Sometimes it's by adding to the gospel. Sometimes it's from taking away from the gospel. Now, in our church and in our culture, we tend to focus on those that are taking away from the gospel. We, we are really frustrated about backsliding. But remember, we've got to be real careful about front sliding as well. Adding things to the gospel. Try to help God out. Surely, if God had had more time to write the Bible, he would have added my rules in as well. That's a temptation for all of us. And all in all, we must make sure that we don't lose the essence of our faith. The gospel of Jesus Christ as it's presented in the whole counsel of God in the Bible. Let's keep Christianity weird. Let's keep Christianity peculiar. We've got to stop trying to help God out by adding our thoughts and requirements to the gospel or by taking things we don't like away. At the end of the day, it's God's prerogative in his word alone that matters. And we don't want to rob people of the greatest gift they've ever received. This morning, from these beautiful stories, I want to help you see three ways to keep Christianity weird. Three ways to keep Christianity weird weird first is this we must embrace god's ordinary means we must embrace god's ordinary means do you remember the last time uh, when really the stories that we're looking at here in samuel really got started do y'all remember what had happened Israel had lost a battle, and it was kind of clear the elders came to the conclusion that it was due to the Lord's displeasure at some level or another. Now, the text never really says whether that was the case or not, 
but they assumed it had something to do with God. And so, what did they do? They beat their chests, and they put on sackcloth and ashes, and they repented? No, that's not what they did. No, 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 they didn't do that. They went, and they prayed, and they asked God, God, why did we lose this battle? No, that's not what they did. They went, and they said, "I'll, I'll tell you what we'll do. If God's not happy with us, we'll force his hand. So they went, and they got the Ark of the Covenant, and they had Hophni and Phinehas, the two clown judges of Israel, wicked clowns, right? And they have them bring the Ark out, And they thought they would twist God's arm into honoring them. But the Ark of the Covenant is not God. Now, it's a sign of God's presence, and it's a sign of God's covenant with the people of God, but it's not God. And the Ark is not God's presence. The Ark is an object uh, around which the the people of God uh, would worship, surrounding which they would worship. Inside it, though, were tablets containing the law, the Word of God. And so they ignored what was inside the ark and tried to use it as sort of a totem and trot it out into battle and they got destroyed and the ark got toted off and Hophni and Phinehas died and then Eli the priest died and now Samuel has sort of risen to the judgeship of Israel so in the aftermath of the ark finally making it back to Israel Israel seems to have learned a lesson verses three and four tell a little bit about the lesson that they've learned Samuel said to all the house of Israel, If you are returning to the Lord with all your heart, then put away the foreign gods and the Ashtaroth from among you and direct your heart to the Lord and serve him only, and he will deliver you out of the hand of the Philistines. So the people of Israel put away the Baal, the Baals, and the Ashtaroth, and they served the Lord only. These are two idols that were associated with an ancient Near Eastern fertility cult. The Ashtaroth being the female version of of the gods and the male version being the Baal. And they were were a fertility cult. And so these idols were in their very nature sexual in nature. So this isn't just idol worship. This is something beyond that. This is a, a deep affront to God. And it seems like Samuel is now leading them to embrace a sort of authentic religion before the Lord. First, we see, what do they say in verse 5? Notice this. Chapter 7, verse 5. Samuel said, Gather all Israel at Mizpah, and I will pray to the Lord for you. The first thing they embrace is prayer. Isn't this a funny thing? Isn't it strange how prayer was missing in the last episode? where the Philistines had gathered for battle. That's going to happen here in a moment. In fact, the Philistines are going to see the way they've gathered, and they're going to come up and think that they've gathered for war. And they're going to purpose to attack the Israelites. In other words, they didn't come together and say, we're going to worship God, and we're going to respond to God in prayer so that we can go win battles. No, they didn't choose the battle. God chose the battle. God sent the Philistines to fight. No, they're here simply on their faces before God. Samuel is praying for them, and then as the battle is about... To begin, in verse 8, they say again, they say to Samuel, Do not cease to cry out to the Lord our God for us, that he may save us from the hand of the Philistines. Do you see how they're starting to get it? At least it seems. Do you see how they're starting to get it? It's God who must fight our battles. And if God's going to fight our battles, we must be a people of prayer. If, If we are the sort of people who don't believe God will fight our battles, nothing seems like a waste of time like prayer does. Why? We spend all this time praying, we could be out doing something. I know you've thought it. You can admit it. But the reality is, if we truly are dependent on God, if we truly believe that God is the one who saves, if we truly believe it's God who fights our battles for us, we will be a people of prayer. The ordinary, simple, basic means of prayer we are not that yeah yeah yeah. of course we should pray but let's also no that's not who we are we are a people first and foremost of prayer but you'll notice also that another ordinary means by which these people are entering back into a proper relationship with the lord is authentic religion authentic religion you can see some of this in verses six and seven the thing just i'm sorry verses six and seven of chapter seven so they gathered at Mizpah, drew water, and poured it out before the Lord, and fasted on that day, and said there, this pouring out of water is some sort of a symbolic ritual of repentance. But they say there, we have sinned against the Lord. And Samuel judged the people of Israel at Mizpah. 
And then the Philistines hear and gather up for battle. Instead of trying to force God's hand, they embrace authentic repentance for their sins. Brothers and sisters, they're not repenting because they want to win a battle. They're repenting because they're sorry about how they've treated God. They're not using God as a means to an end. They're authentically coming to the Lord. They've abandoned their foreign gods. They're abandoning their idolatry, and they're coming to God in repentance. Now, isn't it ironic as these Philistines gather up, they see them, they hear the news from their scouts that they're supposedly that they're gathered up here at Mizpah and the Philistines start to gather up for war, assuming that Israel is coming to fight them, perhaps. But instead, they're actually gathered up to repent and to pray, to renew their relationship with the world. But isn't it ironic? Isn't it ironic that when their focus is on themselves, they lose? When they take God and say, come on, God, let's go fight a battle, they lose. When their hearts aren't in the right place, they lose. But now that their focus is on God, and they're not even really thinking about the Philistines or fighting battles or winning, they're in sackcloth and ashes, they're humbled before God. Now they're going to happen upon battle. God will bring the battle to them, and God will act decisively in their favor. In fact, we see that God sends thunder from heaven. He sends a great and loud storm and it confuses the Philistines and the men of Israel rout the Philistines. They have a decisive victory over them. And we see in the ensuing verses the way that God grants victory and gives them some of their lost land back from the Philistine. And I love the way they respond. I love the way they respond and I love the way it's immortalized in the great hymn we've just sung, Come Thou Found. They put up a monument to the Lord. This far the Lord has helped us. We think that means uh, in terms of how far God's gotten them in his faithfulness in time. And it's about God's faithfulness to Mizpah, the new boundary they have uh, where God has uh, allowed them to conquer the Philistines up to this place. Either way, we can truly say, hither by thy help I've come. And so the And so the passage here ends, the chapter ends with the Israelites embracing the most simple and the most basic of ordinary means, simply embracing God and His ways. We see it in their gratitude. We see it in their faithfulness here. My friends, we cannot for a moment get to the place where we think God's ordinary means of grace are not enough or they're too much. We may want to come up with every strange thing to do, but the reality is that God's ordinary means are the best ways to see God move and act. Prayer, worship, community, the Lord's Supper, preaching, teaching, baptism, those simple, basic things that God has given us are the building blocks of His church. And we can go out and try to come up with every way we can think of to twist God's arm into blessing us, and we can come up with every flashy way and flashy thing to do, but the reality is, and listen, I don't think it's wrong to try. I don't think it's wrong to try to reach people. Don't mishear me. But what we focus on, what we really base our lives on are the simple things that God's given us to reach the world around us. Ordinary means. It seems so weird, doesn't it? But prayer and repentance seems like a horrible way to win a battle. I mean, can you imagine being the guy who's standing there and says, um, yeah, guys, I think some Philistines are over here. We've prayed, we've repented. I'm confident God's going to send a great clap of thunder and confuse them and we're going to kill them all. It was like, great strategy, man. Leave us alone. We're going to try to come up with something real to do. No, God's ordinary means are what work. That seems like a horrible way to win a battle, but God's foolishness is wiser than our wisdom. Second of all, we want to keep Christianity weird not not only must we embrace God's ordinary means but second of all we must count the cost of worldliness we must count the cost of worldliness you can see that there's a a sickness that Israel's shown the same symptom to twice they want to be like the world and so previously they treated their God like the Philistines and the pagans treated their gods like someone who's there just simply to fight for them we make you happy and you make us happy But now the second thing they're doing is they, recognizing that Samuel had wicked sons. Folks, I think it's a good reminder. Plenty of godly parents have children that don't walk with the Lord. Samuel's one of the most profound examples in the Bible of someone who seemed like a new new dynasty was dawning in Samuel, and yet his hopes for a dynasty rooted in his family didn't work. 
And you think about the way the text has been set up so far, it does seem like it would make sense that God would create a new line of judges out of the godly line of Samuel. But Samuel's sons were wicked. They didn't follow the Lord. They weren't fit to be judges. That's not how godliness works. And so the the elders gather, and I want you to notice something that they say uh, to Samuel. Verse 5, they said to him, Behold, you are old. It's a really encouraging start to the meeting. Behold, you are old, and your sons do not walk in your ways. Now appoint for us a king to judge us. And I want you to notice this last phrase. Like all the nations. Samuel is not pleased with this. It makes Samuel upset. He seems to be kind of focused a little bit more on the fact that he, they want someone else to judge them. Um, but nonetheless, God is also displeased with this. God responds in verses 7 through 9 that it's not really a rejection of Samuel so much as it's a rejection of him. Notice what God, how God finishes this. He says, verse 9, Now then, obey their voice, only you shall solemnly warn them and show them the ways of the king who shall reign over them. And then in the ensuing verses down to verse 18, that's what Samuel does. Now, if you're not careful, you can read this as sour grapes a little bit. You don't like me, you're really going to love the next guy. Listen to all this. But remember, God told Samuel to do this. Now, listen to all the things Samuel lists up that's going to happen if they have a king. It would be conscription into military service. Conscription for other services, forced labor for other things, agricultural needs and other things. Their daughters will be conscripted as well. So not just your sons, but also your daughters to be perfumers and cooks and bakers. There'll be possession of your land. Your land will be taken from you and given to other people. There'll be a tax on your harvest. There'll be a tax on your servants and livestock. To sum it all up, he says, you shall basically be his slaves. And then in verse 18, the final warning. And in that day, you will cry out because of your king, whom you have chosen for yourselves, but the Lord will not answer you in that day. I think sometimes we do. We see the abuses done in the name of God. We do the, see the abuses done under the name of the church. We see problems in the church of God, and we decide the world is a better place than what God offers. Now, that doesn't mean that we cannot or will not reform the church. The church should always be reforming and repenting and recovering its theology. But what we do need to remember and understand is that there's a cost to worldliness. The world doesn't give everything it promises. There's always a caveat. There's always a hidden cost. There's no such thing as free lunch in the world. The the same goes with those who wish the church were more like the world to make a bigger difference in the world. Conform, 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 they say, in order that we may be relevant. A word that means everything and nothing all at the same time. Or that we may be relevant. And in our own personal lives, sin seems to offer so much enjoyment, so much pleasure You see your worldly friends and you think how easy your life would be if you could just live like them. You know, if I didn't have all this baggage on me. But my friends, there's always a cost to worldliness. There's always a cost to worldliness. We must count the cost to going to anywhere but God and His grace for our help, for our hope, for our well-being. And I I want to tell you, that's not to say this church is perfect. That's not to say the church is perfect. That's not to say you shouldn't ask questions. I hope you'll ask questions of me. My leadership, the leadership of our church, and I hope that we'll always be making sure we're lined up with the Bible, but I hope we'll always be making sure we're lined up with the Bible and not with the world. Have you counted the cost? Is life in the world as perfect as you think? Have we counted the cost of worldliness? Sometimes I fear we haven't. Here's the last way to make, keep Christianity weird. Here's the final thing. It's really a summary of all of this. Walk by faith and not by sight. You see, this passage is hinting at one of the strangest things about the Bible. One of the most perplexing things about the Bible. One of the things that frustrates us most about the Bible. And it's this, God is as concerned, if not more concerned, about our hearts than he is about that thing that we seem to want. And here's why I say that, and why this passage reveals that. There are passages in the law, there are hints all throughout the Old Testament before Israel receives a king that one day there would be a kingship in Israel. God planned to give Israel a king. 
And so we might look at this and say it was so sinful for them to want a king. Well, not exactly. Not all desire to have a king is sinful, but it was sinful in this particular moment because of the heart behind it. Here we see the way Israel's heart is being exposed for wanting a good thing. It's not wrong or sinful to have a king for the wrong reasons. As I say so often, we are addicted to what we can see. Notice how the author sheds a little more light on the desire the Israelites had for a king. The people refused to obey the voice of Samuel, verse 19, and they said, No, but there shall be a king over us, that we also may be like all the nations. Okay, we've heard that already. And that our king may judge us. We've heard all that already. But notice there's something new they mentioned here. And go out before us and fight our battles. Do you see... Do you see that it's not just worldliness? It's not just a rejection of God's ordinary means that's leading the Israelites to this moment. It's fear. It's fear. You know what you can't see? You can't see the Spirit rushing on a judge ahead of time to go out and fight Israel's battles for them. You cannot predict that the Spirit would rush on Shamgar and he would kill 600 Philistines with an ox goad. You can't predict that God would use a clap of thunder and deliver you in the midst of battle. You cannot see God fighting your battles for you. And so they wanted a king because they were afraid. Not only do they want to be like the nations, but they're afraid of the nations. They want a warrior they can see and that they'll get. One they can see all the time because he's head and shoulders above them all. They want a king that will look them, make them look like the nations. And sure enough, he'll make them look like the nations in countless ways that Samuel predicted. They wanted someone to fight their battles for them. And that they'll get. One who will fear them more than he fears God. And in verse 22, as this story comes to a close... We see God grant them their wish, obey their voice, and make them a king. And Samuel then said to the men of Israel, Go every man to his city. The best way, the clearest way, the only way to keep Christianity weird is to walk by faith and not by sight. Nothing seems stranger, nothing is harder. Nothing will challenge you and those around you like trusting the Lord, like having faith in God. Brothers and sisters, today, would you step into the weirdness of grace? Do you see the way that God contradicts our natural legalism? Legalism makes sense, but God contradicts us. We don't whoop people with the good book. Instead, we let the Bible loose, and God does His work by His Word. God contradicts our flashiness. We want the visible, the extraordinary, the conspicuous, but God works through ordinary means. God contradicts our worldliness, our desire to be like those around us. We want to be like them no matter what the cost may be, but God is pleased to build for himself a peculiar, a strange, a weird people. God contradicts our addiction to what we can see because we want what can be seen, what works, what is practical, but God leads us by faith and not by sight. Oh, brothers and sisters today, I want you to open your eyes in faith and see the strangest, the weirdest, the most peculiar sight of all. Open your eyes by faith and see the king of the world, the king of the cosmos, the one whom is the end of all these stories we're reading in the Old Testament, pinned to a cross, bleeding, dying, suffering God's wrath. And through that Roman instrument of torture that was a symbol of their ruthlessness and occupation of the very nation of which we're reading now, thereby God was conquering the world. Today, would you open your eyes by faith and see Jesus and trust Him, perhaps even for the first time. I want to offer an invitation this morning. 
If you've never put your trust and faith in Jesus, I want to offer you today to turn from your sins in repentance and turn to God in faith and you will be saved. It seems simple, doesn't it? That's because it is. It's because it is. That's how God saves us. It's his strength. It's his power. Not what we do, but what he does on our behalf by grace through faith. Second of all, second of all, you may be a believer. You may need a few moments to pray. I'd love for you to come forward today. And finally, you may be looking for a church home. What a joy it would be for me to talk to you today about what it means for you to be a member here at First Baptist Church. After this prayer, I want to invite you to come. Let's pray together.